Hello and welcome um, once again to Have We Got Planning News For You. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us again. Uh, now, as you've noticed, uh, probably already, uh, if you haven't seen uh, on our LinkedIn, for a second time this year, second time in three episodes, we're a man down this week. Our esteemed guest, George Clark, has had to postpone. Um, he's not very well, but he's going to be back. He's not cancelling. He's going to be joining us later on in Series 3 once he's better. We're all over the moon, actually, as well today, because we've just heard we can reveal that the Minister of Planning, um, Chris Princher, uh, MP, is going to be joining us later on in Series 3 as well. So some hugely um, interesting guests ahead. Um, now, in George's absence, we've decided against wheeling in a substitute um, at the last minute. Um, so instead, um, you're stuck with the five of us, uh, and we're going to offer you our... Um, usual case updates dates, um, with an extra case in that's been decided this afternoon um, and then we're going to have a debate uh, and discussion about um, virtual events and should they say and uh, should they stay should they go should they stay partially etc um, my usual reminder of course um, uh, to consider making a charity donation in lieu of a registration fee you know by now that charities we support are particularly the NHS combined charities, Just Giving Page and Shelter. But as always, please feel free to choose a charity of your choice if you would prefer. And hello, as always, to our YouTube viewers. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which I think now has over a thousand subscribers. Um, now, time to introduce the panel. Um, Mary is also trying to guess where you are. Oh, don't, is this? I'm, I'm, in I'm in the office. I'm in the office. New room, very arty. New art, is it, or, or different room? No, it's no, it's not new art. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd give you a glimmer of art in the office. The, yeah, a lovely, very, very town nice. legal office. Thank you. And, and what are you drinking this evening, Mary? I'm still on Yorkshire tea. Remember that very uh, large yes, box we bought? Got about fifty packets left. <laughs> in my in my town mug. Thank you. <laughs> lovely. And um, Paul, um, how are you? Feeling better? I'm feeling a great deal better um, on day three of an inquiry and I've decided that I can break open the alcohol midweek. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure what the theme of the uh, the show was going to be today, but I know that on the WhatsApp we talked about not Yorkshire. So I asked my son and I've got the new South Wales flag there. Who <laughs> knew that there, that we could even buy it in the UK? So um, I love how you chose you nominated a not Yorkshire um, theme on the, on the day that I'm actually in Yorkshire and talking about a case from Yorkshire. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the East Riding City, Riding Colours in the back. I'm doing an inquiry for them. Uh, uh, this week, which we're doing sort of partly, um, partly all in the same room, separated, etc. Um, and Paul, very before sweet we go on, left you in. Before we, yes, quite. Um, be before we uh, we go on, um, uh, so I mentioned this on on our LinkedIn page, but I got the shock of my life um, uh, on Sunday when I started reading the Sunday Times because when I got to the business section, um, <laughs> I saw this. I literally nearly spat my coffee out. Quantitative easy was right in 2008, which run its course says Sir Paul Tucker. Well, that's A, an awesome, awesome side hustle, and B, we now know that why, why you have all that, all that armour. <laughs> you are a knight, after all. <laughs> so, um, but then you said apparently there's a few more dubious Paul Tuckers um, around about. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're, going to, um, we're going to enter you for the Paul Tucker of the Year competition. I think you've got a good chance of getting to the top three. Yeah, I'll, I'll come second. <laughs> Um, Sasha, how are you, mate? I'm very well, Charlie. Thank you. And uh, in honour of the most successful team in December and January, I'm wearing the Gooners top <laughs> and very much not in yours. Um, so I'm in London and I'm drinking peach and raspberry still water. Don't ask me why. I can't explain it, but that's what was in the, the fridge. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, much looking forward to the show. This is, this is the first time since episode one series one we haven't had a guest so yes that's right hey, yeah it just, yeah it just yeah and um, uh chris lovely to see you um, for the second inquiry i think in in the space of about three months uh i'm doing this week somebody produced a document produced by you um which uh, i was tempted to ask the inspector to subpoena you so i could cross-examine but um, yeah. Oh, love it, love uh, it. I'd, I'd have come. Uh, it's an interesting light array above your head, Charlie. It looks like something from Star Wars, you know? It's, uh, you're well, in the offices of East Riding, is that right? I am, but it's funny you say that, because if you can see, it is a bit like, you know, you, you and your number five uh, setup have the spaceship setup. Well, Stephen um, uh, has basically replicated that in our room, so we've all got our own desks in the Chris Young style. Um, uh, okay. So, yes, well, indeed the Starship. I have been in a high court case today with JCB uh, against the fabulous Jenny Wigley um, and Hugh Flanagan, was for the Secretary of State, uh, but all from home. So weird, isn't it? Really, we can discuss that a bit later. Um, 
Now, I am drinking Apley Ale, which is um, from Shropshire. And I've got a client who's promoting a new settlement and they just happen to have a farm shop full of ale. So yeah. that's quite convenient. And then uh, Presumption is dressed, I don't know if you can see this, <coughs> dressed in his Cheltenham Town scarf. Oh, yeah. Cheltenham Town top because Cheltenham Town very nearly pulled off the biggest FA Cup uh, um, surprise of all time and were ahead. <laughs> and so five minutes were ahead of Manchester City. I mean, absolutely amazing. Um, and contrary to all rumours, I did not set off those fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> we, we believe you. We believe you, Chris. <laughs> um, well, Charlie Banner here. Um, as, as you've heard already, I'm, I'm up in East Riding uh, legally, uh, in accordance with regulations, doing a, an inquiry this week. Last week, we had Stephen Hunt as our special guest this week. He's one of two people in this room, our first live audience of sorts, sitting behind me, out of, out of view. Um, and, uh, and I'm drinking... Um, a, a beer from Yorkshire, Frothing and Best, which is absolutely delicious. Um, very much uh, enjoying it. Um, now, um, uh, we're going to go straight to our, our cases, and uh, I'm kicking off um, with a, um, a case um, that we've actually already covered before at the High Court, um, Client Earth uh, against the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, I think it was in Series 1 when we uh, covered Mr Justice Holgate's dismissal of this judicial review challenge uh, to the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Bay's decision in October 2019 to grant a DCO to, to Drax Power um, for two natural gas fueled generating units at the Drax Power station uh, near Selby in, in North Yorkshire, another Yorkshire theme in our non-Yorkshire themed episode. Um, and uh, this judgment that came out um, a few days ago is the uh, appeal um, from Mr Justice Holgate's judgment. The first issue, and, and probably the one of most significance, um, related to the Secretary of State's approach to need, and this has wider implications for uh, consideration of need, at least in relation to energy DCOs, uh, and, and quite possibly more broadly. Um, the PINs examining authority had said that no weight should be given to the need for the proposed development, because based upon energy um, current energy projections, there wasn't actually any need for this particular development in this location. And um, what PINs uh, considered was that an assessment of need is required for every energy um, NSIP. The Secretary of State didn't agree. Um, and she held that um, the effect of the uh, national policy statement EN1, which introduced a presumption in favour of energy development such as this in the light of the general UK need for energy development, meant that the specific need for each individual proposal didn't have to be proved. You took it as a given, effectively. Uh, and the claimants didn't agree. Uh, they said that was a, a misinterpretation of the uh, NPS. Um, and the, the case that they put forward before the Court of Appeal was that EN1 only established the need for particular types of energy infrastructure, particular categories, and not every project within that category will necessarily contribute to meeting the overall need. And therefore, so they said, it was necessary to consider in each case the actual contribution that this particular project would make to satisfying uh, the need for the, that particular type of energy infrastructure. And that was essential to concluding the, the, whether or not a DCO should be granted. Um, the Court of Appeal disagreed, and they concurred in general terms with Mr Justice Holgate's view that the Secretary of State rightly interpreted the NPS um, in what I might describe as a characteristic judgment. Lord Justice Lindblom said this was all a matter of weight. Um, he, he said that the proper interpretation was that uh, the sub substantial weight which was to be given to um, consideration and need on the NPS, but then thereafter, whether there was a, a basis for departing from that starting point was a matter of judgment for the Secretary of State, and it was none of the court's business. Um, that could only be challenged on Wednesday's ground. This won't be the first time you hear this week of Lord Justice Limbaugh saying it's all a matter of weight. Um, <laughs> and um, a second ground of challenge or appeal related to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, another concurrent consistent theme of recent case law. And, and Client Earth said, uh, the, as, as claimants and parents, that the Secretary of State had misinterpreted the NPS, AEN1, as requiring her um, to treat the greenhouse gas emissions of the proposed power station as having no weight or, or being irrelevant. And Lord Justice Limbaugh said that, that mischaracterised what the Secretary of State had done. 
Um, in his view, she had properly followed the policy, uh, which wasn't that greenhouse gas emissions were irrelevant, but that they were not of themselves an automatic or insuperable obstacle to consent being given for any of the infrastructure to which EN1 uh, relates. Um, so in other words, they were relevant, but they weren't really a, a deal breaker. Um, and that was something that Secretary of State was entitled to uh, proceed on the basis of. The third and final ground, which is not really quite so interesting, was that the Secretary of State hadn't properly weighed the adverse impacts against the benefits. That was rejected too for similar reasons. And essentially, um, the Court of Appeal thought that the Secretary of State was fully entitled in this context too to give considerable weight to the scheme's compliance uh, with the N1 and that any uh, challenge to that was again interfering with matters of judgment. So, really, I see this case, and I think I said the same thing when, when I was summarising Mr Justice Holgate's uh, judgment, I see this as really underscoring the importance of national policy statements for um, infrastructure projects that are the subject of the DCO regime. Um, in, in many cases, the, the big debates and the big issues are resolved at that, uh, in this MPS stage, and, and therefore I think it's no surprise that um, particularly campaign groups who are against particular categories of infrastructure are increasingly focusing on challenges to MPSs or seeking to uh, procure reviews of national policy statements and then potentially JR the failure to review, uh, recognising that a lot of the really big issues are decided at that stage and it may be too late um, to raise them at the DCO stage. So that's my, uh, my case. Now, um, Chris, you're going to tell us about a case um, ASDA brought against Leeds. I am, I am. Uh, we try not to talk about Yorkshire, but uh, we're going to have to because uh, this is another case from um, the Court of Appeal, the judgment of the senior president of tribunals, who's Lord Justice Keith Lindblom. And um, you can see there that the claimant was represented by Paul Tucker uh, and Sarah Reid of King's Chambers. Uh, and defending successfully Leeds City Council was Stephanie Hall, also of King's Chambers, um, and Rupert Warren turned up as well. Um, there's, um, uh, no, Rupert uh, played a very important role on behalf of his clients protecting uh, the planning permission. Um, now, judgment was handed down on the 20th of January, and it concerned a judicial review challenge to the decision of Leeds City Council on the 5th of April 2019 to grant planning permission to Commercial Development Projects Limited, that's uh, Rupert's clients, for the redevelopment of a site of some six hectares at the former Benyon Centre on the Middleton Ring Road in Leeds, which really is just an absolute beauty spot there. Uh, there we can see it, um, gorgeous part of Leeds. Uh, I don't think that's in the Dales. Um, <laughs> and um, it was a mixed use development, including a little store. There we go, the Benyon Centre. Doesn't that look lovely? Um, and it's going to be redeveloped, which is very positive, and uh, going to be redeveloped for a little store and a BM home store. Uh, but Asda were on the site next door and they challenged the decision. Uh, there was also an existing BM store in the, uh, in the Middleton District Centre, which um, the operator said they would close um, and the council estimated there'd probably be an, about an 18 month period when there'd be a void. But obviously, as things have changed during COVID, that is a much more speculative uh, time frame, I think, for a unit to be redetermined. So the officers recommended refusal to the members on the basis um, of uh, the development plan and particularly the test in the MPPF. Now, what Keith Lindblom does in his judgment, which is really, really helpful, is he puts into the first paragraph what the case is about. So if we just have a look at the first page, he tells us what it's all about. The question for the court was, did a local planning authority err in law when granting planning permission for a large mixed use retail development because it misinterpreted or misapplied the government policy for retail development in paragraph 90 of the MPPF? That was the central question in the case. Uh, and as ever, Paul uh, kept a very focused uh, uh, case on that single issue. And the court then turned to consider that. Let's just remind ourselves, uh, hopefully on the next page of paragraph 90, what that test is. Um, paragraph 90 uh, is the test that says where an application fails. Uh, there we go. Paragraph 90. Um, where an application fails to satisfy the sequential test, 
or is likely to have significant adverse impacts on one or more of the considerations in paragraph 89, so a retail impact, it should be refused. And the point that, that Paul was making was, well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That, that says it should be refused. Um, and there's no exceptions to that. It's not like uh, the test for less than substantial harm in heritage. It's a very clear, straightforward refusal. And so that has to be approached in a particular way. And so what the court said, he said moving his screens to make sure he can read it. Um, what the court said uh, was that um, it is right that that is an important paragraph but as far as the interpretation was concerned, in circumstances where it's accepted the proposed development as here would have a significant adverse impact, about a 43% effect on trade, on the vitality and viability. Um, what it says is the planning policy should be refused in circumstances it contemplates, including where the development proposed will have a significant adverse impact. The word should be refused, have a clear meaning which requires no elaboration by the court, they do not mean must be refused. Now, in fairness to, I don't think Paul was arguing that, but the court was saying um, it doesn't mean, even when those words are that clear, and that appears elsewhere in the MPPF, it doesn't mean it must be refused. The policy is not imperative. It does not dictate a refusal of planning permission wherever the development proposed is likely to have a significant adverse impact. Um, and then if we just move on to um, paragraphs 40 and 42, what the court said is that um, plainly, if the decision maker ignores the government policy in paragraph 90, it would fail to have regard to a material consideration. So you could bring a challenge on that basis. The, the council just completely failed to consider paragraph 90, but they haven't done that. That was set out in the committee report. The decision maker must be aware of the policy and of approving a development likely to have a significant adverse impact on the vitality and viability of town centre, it must be conscious of the fact that it's making a decision contrary to the proposition in government policy that it should be refused. So what decision makers need to do, and there's good practical advice here for officers, you need to acknowledge that there will be a, um, an adverse impact if there is one, and you need to acknowledge that the MPPS says it should be refused. But as here, there were other material considerations and the members focused, um, as is often the case in urban areas, they focused on the job creation um, and the creation of uh, new retail units. And so um, the decision uh, was upheld in the High Court and the Court of Appeal upheld the High Court's judgment as well. Um, but I have to say a really interesting case. Um, I don't know if we've got any more of the text there. That there are several paragraphs which go into the issue of interpretation. I think this is my favourite in terms of the, the importance. The crucial point, therefore, is this. Even if a policy in paragraph 90 is rightly regarded as containing a presumption, um, uh, the presumption is one that can be overcome by countervailing factors which are not specified or limited by the policy itself, might include planning benefits such as job creation in an area where unemployment is high, and an uplift in the economy by the development proposed. Inevitably, this will be more difficult or less according to the nature and degree of the significant adverse impact the development is likely to have. Potential harm will vary from proposal to proposal. And this in particular at the end, a significant adverse impact is not a uniform concept. So it doesn't have a particular single weight and a particular single significance. It will vary from case to case. So the outcome of all of this is that um, it's planning judgment again, um, but that is a test that doesn't cause the development to be refused, but it does, as, as this decision makes clear, have to be approached appropriately. And if you're gonna outweigh it with other factors under section 38.6, then those need to be clearly stated and you need to acknowledge the policy. There we go. And um, just for anybody's benefit, um, Paul Tucker, has certainly beaten me in a retail case. Remember Tesco versus Sainsbury's when we're out up in Southport and uh, he put an excellent case on behalf of his clients. Um, although we dragged it through for about two years and, and just delayed the development. But um, yeah, <laughs> Paul, Paul usually wins for the retailer. Thanks, Chris. And it, um, that's two, two Yorkshire, um, Yorkshire judgments in a row. Can we make it three, Mary? 
No, no, I'm going to whisk you away. I'm going to whisk you away to the south coast. And interestingly, I'm going to take you to the Parkview decision, which I, I have to say, Graham Parry uh, has sent a message, Paul, saying that you are not to look at the Park Homes decision because it's, quote, quotes, too close to home. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, we, you can explain that, that comment later. So Chichester, and in particular to Southgate Street, which is a charming street um, full of shops uh, on the south coast. And it has shops, restaurants, bars, and typically residential accommodation above some of these. This is a decision by David Elvin QC, sitting as a Deputy High Court Judge, as you can see. And this is a challenge to a decision by Chichester District Council to grant permission under Section 73 for development without compliance with conditions. So bear with me because it's important just to uh, set the scene. This, the original permission dated back to 2000 and it was a change of use from a shop, an A1 use to an A3 at the ground floor with an ancillary hotel uh, bedrooms above. And the premises were operated um, and they were called the vestry. And maybe Mr. Tucker has had one or two many, two, too many uh, drinks in the vestry. Uh, who, who knows? But anyway, uh, he wouldn't be the only one of us who's, who succumbed to the charms of Chichester. Uh, I, um, I, I digress. Let's, let's stick to the facts. The <laughs> original permission, the original permission uh, from 2000 was subject to a number of conditions, as, as you might expect, having set the scene. One was that the building had to be used for A3 uh, accommodation with the simply with the hotel accommodation and all other uh, use classes were excluded. There was an hours uh, uh, of use operation uh, limit uh, condition and there was also a condition pro prohibiting amplified music. And there was a, a condition particularly requiring the uh, construction of the roof to, to be constructed in such a way as to ensure that the ambient noise level was limited to between 25 to 30 uh, dBA. The claimant in this case owned a property next door which was under development for residential accommodation pursuant to a permission uh, which had been granted a few years earlier. Uh, and in 2017, a premises license was granted, enabling uh, the vestry to uh, show a film, uh, conduct live music, have a performance of live music, um, performing, ha have dancing, late night refreshment, uh, and of course, the, the sale of alcohol. And that license didn't restrict the level of the noise generated by the premises. In response to a threat for enforcement of enforcement action, the operator of the vestry, the interested party in this case, got a, a certificate of lawful use, which certified that in fact the use was an A4 use. Okay, so just remember original permission A3, they end up with a cluid A4, and then they apply under section 73 to vary and extend some of the conditions, in particular, the hours of opening. And the Environmental Health Department were concerned about the noise impacts, and they were very concerned about the separating structural wall between this, these premises and the adjoining residential development, which was under construction. And they thought it was unlikely that there would be no adverse effect on the residential amenity because the nature of the use was such that the noise levels would exceed those that were uh, anticipated in the original A3 permission. And they wanted testing, sound testing of this structure to take place. The section 73 application was the subject of a delegated permission and the officer recognized the importance, the crucial issue being the impact of this proposal on the noise, uh, 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 um, on noise on the adjoining residential development. But instead of granting conditions 
as the EHO had sought, and in particular ensuring that, that th this testing took place, subject to a number of informatives. Well, we all know that informatives uh, are not planning conditions. Uh, and there was, an, there was another uh, issue here because the applicant proposed to put in place a noise limiter, a device which effectively limits the noise that could be made and cuts off the noise levels when they exceed a certain point. And again, that wasn't the subject of a condition. It was simply the subject of an informative. So the claimant challenged this permission and the on four grounds. The first ground was that the Section 73 permission was unlawful because it was beyond the scope of the powers under Section 73 because the original permission was for a A3. And yet the Section 73 application, because of the Cluid, no doubt, was expressed to be for an A4 use. Interesting, interesting, I think. Uh, and this is a, you know, it's a topic, isn't it, that many of our planning consultants are grappling with all the time. Uh, post uh, Arrowcroft and in particular post Finney and the Welsh ministers, uh, which uh, we've talked about. And so David Elvin, uh, sitting as the uh, deputy judge, didn't have any difficulty in uh, acceding to that ground and finding that the Section 73 permission was, was indeed unlawful because you couldn't effectively use a Section 73 to vary the description of the development. And secondly, uh, the, the second ground was that um, it had been perverse to simply use, um, instead of using conditions, to use informatives which have no teeth. And, uh, and he said it was uh, perverse of the council through its officers to note the importance of the limiter, but then fail to secure its compliance via a condition, merely using an informative. Um, so he had no difficulty in quashing this permission on, on the first two, two grounds. The, the third and fourth ground were um, about the consultation and the fact that um, the EHO had insisted uh, upon this testing, but that the testing again hadn't been secured. He, he didn't feel that he needed to reach a decision um, on these grounds but he felt that there was substance to them. And then I think the other interesting thing is, is that old chestnut of discretion. You know, even when there's a legal error, the claimant says, oh, um, but it wouldn't have made any difference. And uh, David Elvin was at, 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 at pains to point out that the errors here um, were manifest and, you know, the court, and this isn't, I don't think a surprise to our listeners, uh, is unable to say, he said, with any degree of certainty, or, or confidence, whether the outcome would have been the same. And so uh, not unsurprisingly, he, he quashed the permission. So I think, I think uh, the, the, the message here is that when you are embarking on a Section 73 application, you must confine yourself and you must make sure that your permission uh, is within the four corners, as it were, of the original planning application. Because really, um, Quite a, a, a quite a, a lot of time and money and expense was gone to by the applicant uh, when they could have achieved the same result with a fresh planning permission. Thanks, Mary. Uh, interesting case. I, I was struck by your reference to the concept of a noise limiter. Sasha, I think next time we're against each other, I might try one of those on you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now tell me about the Gateshead. Uh, you've got a Gateshead decision to tell us about. I do have a Gateshead decision. I've got a all of us, everyone watching today, I can guarantee you have spent part of their life sitting on that area of the A1 leading into Newcastle and Gateshead, just, just south of the city, which is obviously, we all have the refrain, why the bloody hell is this road not, not wider? Well, some of us do. <laughs> anyway, the, the Highways Agency have started to address that, and it's a major strategic aim of the road network to expand that part of the A1. And as part of that proposal, there is a DCO, which is, thank you very much, Rob. And this is a DCO, as you can see, 19th of January, just very hot off the press, my sister's birthday, in which the Secretary of State for Transport um, uh, has given consideration. There was a long examination, note it, 
from the effectively 21st of January to the 21st of July, on which numerous issues were considered. And I think I think this DCO is, is very interesting because obviously one of the things that occupies us all is what is the practical effect of climate change on, on major infrastructure projects. And I've had this recently in every inquiry where lots of those who object particularly say this is completely incompatible with the climate change emergency. And one can understand that. And one could say expanding six and a half kilometers of the strategic road network expanding southbound from three to four northbound from two to three um how is that compatible with climate change but anyway the the what what is clear about this decision is that the national policy statement um for the national network are predominant i think we all have a view on dcos but the bottom line is if you have a national expression of policy by the government this is all stems probably from 1995 and the, the years spent arguing what government policy on aviation was first year at Heathrow and since then the government have taken it very strongly to always seek to have a policy statement and thus we have the national policies and in the DCA context the clear view is that there is a need um, to improve the general general overarching point is a need to improve the national road network there is significant congestion on this part of the network and therefore the highways agency are right in seeking to meet the aspiration of government to improve congestion um, it is noteworthy this decision because that is in the green belt it was accepted by the examining inspectors there were two of them that this was fundamentally inappropriate development but the very special circumstances outweighed the impact it's also worthy to note that that they clearly took the view the economic benefits were very very significant for improving this so i think the takeaway is for those who are interested in where the national debate lies between the environment climate change and strategic road network and strategic infrastructure is the secretary of state for transport is clearly reaching the view that the needs of the highway user and relieving congestion still seems to predominate so that that is the takeaway from that dco Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. And, and Paul, um, what's your case? Uh, well, well, before telling you about my case, I just want to comment upon Sasha's case, because I thought that the whole purpose of the roads being completely screwed going into Newcastle is so that you can slow down and look at Anthony Gormley's masterpiece of the Angel of the North. I thought that was the purpose of it. You're meant to slow down. It's 50 miles an hour. You look up. It's magnificent. Thunder effect. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thanks to Nicole Walker, because uh, I also agree we should have no more Leeds cases for a long time. Um, the, the judgment that Chris has, has looked where I uh, has read out where I uh, came second, uh, it, it felt like at the end of it, if we'd have done it in a non-virtual way, um, uh, Lord Justice Limblon might have just written, close the door on the way out, Mr Tucker. Um, so my case is a case called Monk Hill. Uh, my, my, it's a, a, a case that, that I saw for the first time uh, this afternoon because it was only handed down this afternoon. Um, so uh, a joy and happiness just before we started that I was able to read it and make comments. So if there's any errors, I apologise in advance. So Monk Hill, uh, uh, the, the case of the Court of Appeal decision, derives all the way back from a decision of Mr Inspector Walcock in respect of the grounds of a Victorian house called Long Dean House, which hopefully, uh, if Rob hasn't dozed off yet through my uh, discussion, he can now bring up a picture and show us Long Dean House. Isn't that lovely? Why would you want to convert that? Uh, well, what, what the applicants wanted to do was to convert that, make better use of it, and also bring forward uh, 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 29 units in the grounds of Long Dean House. And I think we've got the architect's drawings, uh, which shows you, broadly speaking, the nature of the proposal. Um, this was a redetermination because there had been a previous uh, dismissed appeal in relation to this site, thanks, Rob, uh, where the decision had been quashed. So it's a redetermination, and you tend to get senior inspectors when it comes to redeterminations. I won't say anything at all about who was involved in the uh, the first quashing, but you can probably guess from the smiles. Uh, and I've got to say, the address of this place is magnificent. I want to live on Hedgehog Lane. It's just fantastic. Hedgehog Lane, Hazelmere. It sounds like something from childhood. Bitter no, I, I'm sorry, Paul, you're not posh enough, mate, for Hazelmere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a fair point. I, I've, I've had a message saying that I look like I'm an extra from Dad's Army with this flag behind me. Um, so there was a four day inquiry uh, where the, the uh, intellectual might of Charlie Banner as a junior, I think maybe his last case a junior, was against the, the intellectual might. I do mean that with, in both cases of Dr Ashley Bowes. And Dr Ashley Bowes bested Charlie because the decision 
uh, was uh, uh, dismissed by Mr. Inspector Walcock. There were essentially three issues: character and appearance of uh, uh, on the a uh, impact on the AOMB, highway safety, which was raised by the locals but didn't even concern us, and supply of housing land. Well, the supply of housing land was determined in the applicants and the appellants' favour that there wasn't a sufficient five-year land supply. It was either between 3.37 and 4.6. And just as an aside, the decision itself says that Charlie's case was 3.7 years. So it's great that, look, that Mr. Walcock said it was actually less than that. I've never encountered that before. Um, but because of the lack of five-year land supply, uh, Mr. Inspector Walcock uh, found that footnotes um, seven of MPPF was engaged, so the tilted balance was in principle engaged. Uh, the 29 units were in the AOMB, um, so the issue then was whether or not it was major development, and the uh, and Mr. Wilcox said said no, it's not major development, uh, but it, there is significant harm to the AOMB, and by reason of paragraph 172 of the AOMB, uh, he concluded that that was a clear reason to withhold consent. Paragraph 172 of MPPF. Sorry, I should have asked Rob to bring Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilcox's uh, decision up just in case anyone wants to take the reference from it. But paragraph 172 is split in two parts. One part is great weight should be given to anything which affects uh, uh, the character and appearance of the AOMB because this is one of the rare parts of the country because of its beauty. And the second part is there should be a presumption against a, this uh, 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 exception. Uh, uh, you've got to show exceptional circumstances if you are major development in the AOMB. And that distinction is really important from the way in which the case was then argued in the High Court because having disapplied the presumption in favour, uh, Mr. Walcott then dismissed the appeal. There was then an, a, a challenge under Section 288 to the High Court. It came in front of Mr. Justice Holgate. Can I just say, Charlie, when I look at a decision, the first thing I do is search my name. Um, uh, in relation to the Leeds case, my name was mentioned half a dozen times. In your case, in Mr. Justice Holgate's decision, you come up over 20 times in Mr. Justice Holgate's decision. And I and in the Court of Appeal, you're described as being elegant. Elegant? Has anybody met you? Could only have happened in, in, in a slightly strange COVID world. Anyway, Mr Justice Holgate said, thanks, Charlie. Close the door on the way out. So Charlie goes <laughs> up to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and it's, it is like a medieval banquet. It's fantastic, the names that are set out here. Lady Justice Andrews, lovely Lady Justice Andrews, Sir Gary Hickenbottom, and Sir Keith Limblom, as Chris has said, senior president of tribunals, you know that you are uh, going to get a serious hearing when you, when you come across a bench of that name. Right, well, well, the decision is well worth a read. Uh, I, I was a, a great fan of Lord Denning when I was a student, and Lord Denning would come up with these fantastically snappy uh, short sentences. If you ever wanted a, a really entertaining case, read the opening lines of Bolton and Stone about a nuisance involving a cricket field. Well, I think Lord Justice Limblom is doing the same because he starts off this case with what can only be described as an intellectual sigh. Let me read it to you. On many occasions, I'm not, this is not an imitation, this is my voice, I promise, it's my voice. On many occasions, since the MPPF was first published by the government in March 20, uh, 2012, its provisions have had to be considered by the courts. These cases have formed a large part of the work of the planning court since it came into being in 2014. <sighs> Several have come before this court. Two, Hopkins and Sam Smith, have reached the Supreme Court. This is another in the series. That's the lead up to the wicket. It's joyous, and you can see he's enjoyed writing that. So, the, the sole issue that, I mean, it's a, Charlie's hit it exactly right. The, the way you're going for the Court of Appeal, you, you go for the sole issue. You go for a simple point, a simple uh, blunt point, and it's beautifully described in paragraph four. Essentially, it's an interpretation of 172 and what, whether the first part of 172 impact on the AOMB disapplies. And the argument is, well, 172 just tells you for a non-major development um, that you apply great weight to impact. It doesn't say you should refuse. As Chris has said for the Leeds case, that has a number of thou shalt refuse. Paragraph 90 was thou shalt refuse. Well, uh, what, Mr. what Lord Justice Limblom, who gave the lead judgment, uh, said was, well, no, you can't interpret MPPF as if it's a uh, statute. You don't interpret it as, 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 if it's a law, as if you're a lawyer. Look what really it's about. Uh, and th there's a number of key parts, and certainly from paragraph 26 through to 27 and, and partly 29, he essentially says, I think even though the start of paragraph 172 says great weight is to be applied, that that imports a balance. 
And at paragraph 30, he says, in terms, you import a balance. It presupposes there are countervailing factors and that that therefore amounts to a clear reason for uh, uh, disapplying uh, 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 the presumption in favour. The difficulty I have with this, genuinely a difficult, this is not my just being controversial for it, and I've only had two passes through this decision, and no doubt Charlie will agree with me because it's supportive of what he was arguing, is what are those countervailing factors? How do I know, looking at MPPF, what the countervailing factors is? Is it all the benefits? In which case, what's the point of it? Because it's then you might as well just say, thou shalt dismiss, and you, dis you ignore the presumption. It's not clear. I think in paragraph 34, Logistically, Slimblom tries to grapple with that and says, essentially, you are balancing the benefit, but it's again down to a matter uh, of, of planning judgment. What he does also do, and this is really, really important, and it's paragraph uh, 38 and 45, is that he endorses uh, the approach that he said in a case called Watersmead, which is that when you're looking at what's a clear reason, it's not that the site is in Greenbelt, it's not that the site affects heritage, you've got to do the internal balance so that you see if you've got substantial harm to a heritage asset but it's outweighed by the benefits that's not a clear reason to withhold consent it's a really important case and i think from paragraph one even lord justice limblom recognized it might be on its way to the supreme court well thanks, thanks. Uh, and uh, well certainly you're going to have a crack um but um i mean it's, it's interesting the, the um as you say in that particular judgment um a, a strongly purposive approach is taken to the framework because of a concern about the protection of AMB, and yet in the Paul Newman judgment we looked at last week, um, a, a court of appeal with at least one similar member took a very literal religious approach, no relevant policies. Um, another case about paragraph 11, and the, um, you know, on, on one view it might be said that, that um, the court of appeal is, takes a different approach in different cases um, in order to give um, decisions a wide margin of appreciation. Um, but it will be interesting to see if the Supreme Court are interested in, in, in these two paragraph 11 cases, if they do get pursued to the Supreme Court. And of course, one further paragraph 11 case, which is pending judgment, was heard the week after um, Monk Hill, is the Gladman case, which concerns whether development plan conflict can be taken into account in paragraph 11D, which of course is itself meant to weigh against development plan conflict, or is it double counting? And you know, it, it might be thought if, if that case goes against Gladman, I have no idea whether it will. That the collective force of those three, um, judgments is to deprive the framework of a lot of the effect that objectively it was intended to have, which is to build more houses. And maybe I'm a um, In no way was that elegant. Uh, <laughs> in no way am I you, elegant. If you've just tuned in expecting to see an interview with George Clark, <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, apologise now. This might be a bit drier than George. <laughs> well, this is the moment where Chris, our, our in-house master of accents, is going to pretend to be George Clark, and we're going to do a, an interview with him. Uh, no, what we're going to do now... That's right. Of, of the, is we're just going to have a... We, we had a, um, a, a, a special episode of Have We Got Planning News For You for the RCPI Young Planners um, a little while ago, where we had a discussion about the uh, lessons learnt from... Um, virtual, as I prefer to call them, digital uh, events, because they're real events, they're just done digitally. Um, and, and you know, a few months on, we thought we'd have a, another go at that for our wider, regular audi audience, just sharing a few thoughts and welcome any thoughts you had. Some of you have posted some interesting comments already. Uh, and in particular, really, with the focus being, you know, uh, sh should they be here to stay? Should they go post-pandemic or should we have some kind of halfway house? And I think if my memory serves me right, and all of a sudden doesn't, um, uh, but Paul, you go kick us off on this one? Well, I, I'm going to just invite some comments. Before I do, um, can I invite Rob? We, we've, the through poll. the poll. Big mastery, we, uh, we've sorted out a poll, which uh, I think thanks go to Sasha for the hard work in relation to this. So hopefully, uh, during the time that we start chatting about this, you will see a poll coming up, and I'd certainly welcome all the audience to give their views in relation to this. And then once we finish wittering on, then uh, we'll tell you what the results are, or Charlie will tell you what the results are. So... Um, uh, Chris, what, what's been your experience about virtual events? Are you sick to death of them or are they here for the long run? Yeah, well, I've got, um, I'm, it's no secret, is it, about my views about this, which is that um, we're doing them because we have to, and nobody doubts that. Um, and over the summer, I was with my teams and we were doing our inquiries together because I thought it was important and necessary, all that interaction uh, mm. with the team. Right now, though, 
uh, looking at what's going on, looking at the death rate, it just doesn't seem appropriate even to do that if you can do it digitally. So I had a, I had a high court hearing today and I have to say, I found it highly unsatisfactory. Um, the judge had Wi-Fi problems, so we couldn't see the judge uh, at all. Um, so, you know, uh, you get no reaction from your submissions. You just occasionally get this voice going, um, <coughs> do, do, get, do get a move on, Mr. Young. Um, <laughs> Jenny, Jenny Wigley got that as well, to be fair. But, um, and... Um, yeah, it's just completely disconcerting. So whilst the inquiries with your team on a screen, I think have been sort of 90% the same, um, equally, I, I think uh, I, I just don't want this as my future. I mean, I'm sorry, Paul, when you were talking, my daughter just wandered in. Uh, uh, the rabbits are out in the garden and it's gone dark and apparently that's my problem right now. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, but the, the point is that... Um, you know, my kids are at home, but they're going to go to school. They'll be saying, oh, well, they're going to work at ho home in the future. Let why don't kids all just stay at home? They're not going to stay at home because they need socialization. They need interaction. And I'm not sure adults are so much different from children, are they? Uh, so I want to get back to reality as soon as possible. Case management conferences uh, done like this, fine. Mary, Mary, what are your views? I think you've had quite a lot of experience with regard to local plans over the last uh, six months. What, what are your thoughts as to whether there are some things that we could hang on to? I definitely think there are some things that we can hang, hang on to. I mean, I, I share Chris's um, desire to be with people uh, and to be in the room with the team and to, you know, one's natural instincts is you want to see the whites of the other side's eyes and, and also the inspector. And I get that. But I, I think in particular that the local plan examinations that, uh, that I've participated in um, have really worked. And I, I venture to suggest that um, they are more effective for the inspector and quite often for the participants. Instead of all trying to squeeze round a, a table where there's, you know, only one space for one member of your team and you've, you've hard, you, you haven't really got any space, you can maybe stick a laptop on, on the table, you, you, can spread yourself, you can spread yourself out. And I think that programme officers uh, have done a really good job in ensuring that um, all those participating are familiar with the equipment um, and once you've mastered the uh, equipment uh, you know a, a lot of amenity societies have taken part in uh, uh, and parish councils have taken part in uh, local plan examinations that that I've been involved with um, and, and I think it, it has worked well I think and I think we should make the, the most of it. I mean, after all, the white paper is very much pushing uh, for open access and technology. And why shouldn't we um, make the most of that and take the best of, of both worlds? I think I, I do miss the fact that um, you can't have a little chat offside round the table. It's very difficult to, to, to have a, a sort of offside conversation with anybody in a virtual event, which means that you really have to have any offside conversation you want with your opposite number uh, in advance, um, which I think is is a, a disadvantage. Um, but but on the whole, I, I think it is is an advantage. There's one other thing I just I just want to say if I if I'm allowed to. Um, just before Christmas, the there were some changes made to the environmental assessment of plans and programs regulations, which effectively means now that local plan um, SEAs, um, paper copies don't have to be provided and that it, it's all to be done electronically. Now, I do think actually when it comes to an SA, particularly for non-professionals, um, it can be a heck of a paper chase. And I, I slightly worry that we, we just got to be careful actually that um, for non-professionals taking part, they need to have access, uh, I think, and uh, to try and understand reams of in pa pages of information on a screen and absorb that is really quite tough. Absolutely. Much, yeah. much easier to be able to go into your local library, go into your local council and, and at least have access to a paper copy. I completely agree, Mary. I mean, even, I, I must say, I still get it's not very sustainable, but I still get everything printed out. I'm not not the only one, but probably in a minority now. But I still like to mark things up, tab them up. I find it very, very hard to um, 
to absorb information on the screen. The younger gentleman, Matt Henderson, my excellent junior in this, this case I'm doing now, every, he's just has everything on a tablet and always has done. Um, but my brain doesn't work like but that. Charlie, Charlie, who's doing the cross-examining? Um, depends who won the table football the previous night. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sa Sasha, what are your thoughts? You're in the middle of a long inquiry with uh, lots and lots of participants. How, how are you finding it at the moment? Well, I, I mean, it called me slightly old fashioned. I, I think we mustn't forget that we, we are in a quasi judicial process. And I do worry that doing it on Zoom and Teams does reduce for those who are first coming to an inquiry. It does make it more difficult to get across when you're doing an inquiry with two to three hundred third parties. I think it does make it more difficult to give it a sense that this isn't a meeting, frankly, doing it virtually. I also think for an inspector and for witness and advocates, it is better being physically in the same room. You can judge the inspector. I mean, it's very difficult. It's impossible, actually, virtually. I'm now on week 10 or whatever. It's impossible to tell what the inspector is actually doing in terms of writing, what they're looking at, etc. It, it is important to have those cues that you only get physically of seeing what the inspector's doing. Generally, we all say, you know, if we notice an inspector hasn't written anything for 20 minutes, it's a pretty clear sign that they're not interested in the point and you move on. You can't tell that virtually. I also think that... Um, that there is an important point about documentation. It is more difficult to document it, to know who's got what. And as Chris has said, we are subject to the vagaries of Wi-Fi. You lose an inspector for 20 minutes, half an hour, or an advocate, which has happened, and the whole inquiry programme is, is changed beyond anyone's, anyone's fault. The last thing I would say, though, I do think there are serious equality issues. The general mood music at the bar, and I only speak for the bar, is many do like virtual inquiries because obviously it enables a huge degree of flexibility rather than condemning one to go away from a Monday to a Friday, which is an important consideration. So uh, overall, I would say I probably personally I'd like to um, I'd like to go back, but I do acknowledge there are very strong counter reasons for staying with what we've got. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Uh, I'll hand back to Charlie, who I think may have the poll results. Yes. Well, before I do, just my thought is I don't I don't see it as being completely binary um, in terms of I don't think it's a question of do we go back or do we not go back. But I'd equally, I don't. I've not done a blended event like people like our friends like John Easton have done. Um, you know, is it Doncaster um, local yeah. plan? Um, he doesn't hate yeah. people, John. By the way. <laughs> but, 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 so, so, well, but to my mind, you know, it's more about working out what's the right procedure for the for the right case. I mean, EIPs, I think very little is lost, if anything, doing digitally. Um, I actually think the High Court Judicial Reviews, certainly permission hearings, generally tend to be OK. But in the Court of Appeal, done, having done one Court of Appeal, one virtually or digitally and one in person, where they like to ask lots of questions, they're hesitant about asking questions because the three of them, and, and it's harder on the digital format. And if you're for appellant, you want to be asked questions because that's how you persuade judges who may have doubts about your case. I did Monk Hill in, in person. It didn't quite get them over the line, but they had lots of questions. And I was able to be an advocate in a way that you can't really if they don't want to ask questions. Um, so I think it depends. And inquiries, you know, I've had easier inquiries have been fine. Harder inquiries, it kind of helps to, to be able to do it in person. So I think it probably... But uh, I suspect what will end up being is the parties will be asked to make representations on should it be digital or should it be um, done in person uh, and pins will have to kind of refine some criteria about that. Um, that's my thought. I think the diversity point can't be understated. I mean, as a father of a six month old child who's, you know, whose wife, the child's mother also has a full time job. I wouldn't have been able to do some of the inquiries I did in the autumn, quite frankly. I, I, and I think that's the same, isn't it, for public, partic public yeah. participation in planning committees. I mean, I've been talking to um, a, a, a head of legal this week at a council, and um, they were saying to me quite clearly that they have seen a marked increase in the numbers of people participating in planning committees. You know, they're mm. up to the hundreds regularly, uh, as opposed to, you know, just uh, w one or two or or very application specific um, participation. So I think it does make it a lot easier for busy people uh, working to uh, participate at, at all levels, application stage. Uh, God forbid, if necessary, appeal stage. Completely agree. Completely agree, Mary. Well, I certainly think we should YouTube. We should YouTube all inquiries. That's 
to make them more accessible, certainly the ones that people are interested in. And actually on that last thought, I mean, that is a very, it actually encourages people to, to watch um, and, and learn. And I, mean, I know that the, that the recordings that they, the pins do are, are shown into, are available internally for inspectors to watch, but also it's, it's a great way of advertising the planning sector. I mean, let's remember what Rob Winder said. Let's not forget sexy planning. Um, you know, it's a great having the Holocaust Memorial Inquiry, having the Tulip Inquiry available to watch on YouTube. It's a fantastic way to get people, young people inspired yeah. in our profession. Um, so I'm very, very keen about Now we must move on because um, uh, we've hit six o'clock. Um, champion of the week, Sasha, who's your champ? Well, do we have to get the poll result first? Oh, yes, sorry, poll numbers, completely forgot. Goldfish moment as always. Rob, over to you. Let's see, see what um, people are thinking. So um, blended events. So the halfway house is overwhelmingly popular. Um, and then experience of virtual appeals, excellent, good, good and excellent. Uh, overall, sixty what sixty two percent. So you know, fairly clearly in favour, and very few people saying it's poor. And um, the clear majority think the the virtual digital process doesn't really affect one party or other. It's neutral in terms of, of, of fairness or outcome, which is good. So it's an interesting and lots of lots of respondees. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Okay, so um, back to you, Sash, for um, Champion of the Week. Yeah, well, my Champion of the Week, I'm going to go for those at the inspectorate. I mean, we must remember, this is a, quite an important week for those of us who are self-employed. We've got a rather significant moment coming out of our bank accounts in about three days, and I think it is important, all of us involved in the appeal system, to thank PINs and, and Graham Stallwood, the operations manager, for getting inquiries going and you know we've been back since June doing inquiries and the administration of planning appeals has been frankly really good since that time so my champ of the week are those at the planning inspector who are probably doing as many as the normal um, inquiries so thank you very much. Thank you and balancing their own you know domestic issues yeah. with working from home as well as um, it's very apparent. Um, nudge, Paul, who's going to get a nudge from the from Sir Paul Tucker? Well, it's it's going to be a non-planning thing, and it uh, explains why I suggested about an hour and a half before we started that we had a non-Yorkshire theme, uh, and why I've got the New South Wales flag behind me. And the nudge of the week is to my hometown of Scarborough, uh, who have had the ignominy of coming onto the front page of the BBC yeah. News online, because the police are uh, dealing with house parties every night. So this evening, I have to say, little ashamed by my uh, uh, hometown, and I'm joyous to drink some Cornish beer. So if you want me back on the Yorkshire stuff, stop partying in my hometown, please. This is serious. Yeah. And Charlie, I think before we go, we've got quite a big announcement about next week, haven't we? Yes. So next week, uh, we have Dr. Wei Yang, who is, has very recently been inaugurated as the president of the Royal Town Planning Institute, which is also chair of Wei Yang and Partners um, in London. So we're hugely grateful to her uh, and the RCPI for um, joining us next week. As I said, uh, George is going to come and join us on another occasion sometime soon. Um, and, and equally, Chris, Chris Pincher, um, the Minister of Planning, I believe he's coming to join us on the 18th of March, if I got that yeah, date. Yeah, big, big, big news there. Can I just say, I got a text from Steve Quartermain who said, I need to rescue the rabbits before the foxes get them. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely clear when my daughter came in the foxes are, the, fo <laughs> the rabbits are in a run outside i've not just given them to the foxes okay <laughs> i think you're the fox <laughs> I, I think jcb yes. the ecology cross-examination <laughs> <laughs> save peter rabbit quick <laughs> well, um that's all uh, lovely to see you all please do join us again next week um and uh, same time, same place, same code, uh, with Dr. Wei Yang. And I will see you then. Have a lovely weekend ahead. Um, cheers from Yorkshire. Cheers. Cheers. Get better cheers. soon. Get better cheers. soon, George.